I can tell how much somebody knows and loves me by the way they pronounce my last name. So thank you so much, Doug. <laughs> Gratification, it literally means pleasure. Pleasure that's derived from the satisfaction of a desire. Pleasure, desire, satisfaction, sounds pretty good, right? You can combine that with an immediacy of satisfaction and desire and pleasure right here, right now. That is a recipe for immediate gratification and it is seductive. Now, you might guess that I'm pretty good at immediate gratification, and you might be right, but I am also going to suppose that many of you, if not all, are also very good at immediate gratification. In fact, it seems to be the prevailing way. I actually would go so far to wager a bet there is no one in this room who doesn't, at least on occasion, get sucked down the black hole of a social media feed, or YouTube, or hitting the snooze button once, maybe twice. Essentially, all of these are behaviors that indicate that we care less about future consequences and more about what's happening right here in the present moment. As Jeff Bezos said, seek immediate gratification or the elusive promise of it, and chances are that there's a long line of people who got there ahead of you. Now, as we've seen in the Stegen principles for decaders, we're often sold on ways that delayed gratification can benefit us in our day-to-day -day lives. Think about it. If we can resist the, the urge to have an unhealthy food choice, we might become more healthy and fit. If we can resist the urge to binge-watch Netflix when a big project is due, we'll probably finish that project on time. If we can resist the urge to go out for drinks the night before that project is due, maybe we'll finish the project, we'll wake up in the morning, we will resist the urge to hit the snooze alarm. It's as if delayed gratification, it has compound interest. Now, one of the most famous and, I think, entertaining pieces of research around uh, immediate gratification is the marshmallow test. In its simplest essence, the marshmallow test posits that immediate gratification, you know, sometimes it's not such a bad option, but delayed gratification, it has higher rewards, in this case, namely twice the number of marshmallows. So let's watch a clip and see how it plays out. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. It smells really good.
right, so I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> Relatable, right? So subjects of this experiment were followed for years afterwards, and what the researchers found was that the group that was able to earn that second marshmallow they scored significantly higher in measures like their SAT scores and lower in things like substance abuse, like jail time, like obesity. Essentially, over and over and over again, in the 40 years that they studied these subjects, they found that no matter what capacity they measured them in, they were more successful than their peers. In fact, what the researchers told us is that delayed gratification is a critical element for success in life. So as we've seen, we're hardwired for immediate gratification, and if it's not bad enough, we live in a society that is priming us to behave even more this way. So take a look at what happens in a single minute on the Internet. The numbers speak for themselves, and they are staggering. Now, these are technologies and things that didn't exist just a few years ago. Things like, imagine Amazon Prime. Well, I can choose to have something on my doorstep in a couple of days or same day. With things like Uber Eats and Postmates and Instacart, I can have a meal or the ingredients for that meal on my doorstep in minutes. With Tinder, you can meet people within seconds. Now, these technologies, they all have a name, not surprisingly or imaginatively. Uh, they're called instant gratification technologies, and they take what used to take us hours, days, weeks, even months, and they speed things up. And you might say, yeah, instant gratification, it's not really anything new, but I would say that this shows us that our definition of instant has certainly changed. And the thing about this instant gratification, it is fueling our impatience. Think about how you feel when you have a slow internet connection. So frustrating, right? We even complain about a slow internet connection when we're on an airplane hurtling through the sky. It's kind of crazy. So, what then shall we do? This this represents one of my very favorite pieces from the Stegen learning environment. It's called a well-felt presence. And it takes us away from that impatience, the, the immediacy, the intoxication of immediate gratification. Because that immediate gratification, it is numbing, and those companies, they are counting on us to become numb. So what I want to tune into in my own personal call to adventure is more moments of well-felt presence and stringing them together towards my well-lived life. And what that looks like for me is completing a series of beautifully completed projects. And it's something I want to do for myself, but it's also something that I'm doing for my kids, because I want to illustrate to them that they can live the lives of their dreams. And the way that we're doing that is by completing things, starting and finishing. But the thing is, if I'm standing here on this beautiful vista, and my beautifully completed projects are over there with a nice bow tied on them, the problem is what you don't see in the picture is the canyon of distraction. And inside that canyon is all manner of immediate gratification. So how then do we bridge that divide? So, as Doug mentioned, some of you might be familiar with me from the decade I spent in conscious capitalism. And what was most compelling to me during my time there was the opportunity to work with business leaders 
who had a commitment to their own personal development and an understanding that personal development is the key to professional development. Now, I became a real student of this. I conducted more than 60 interviews with conscious business leaders and then other high performers. I interviewed artists and musicians and athletes and authors all around the concept of what their personal practices were. What was it that fueled them to show up optimally for what they were doing? And what I found was that all of these leaders that I admired so much, they had this thing in common, and that was a dedication and a consistency with their personal practices. Whether it was yoga or meditation or hiking the Appalachian Trail, they all had something that they were dedicated to with relentless consistency, and it fueled their optimal performance. Now, while I was studying this, I became really immersed in my own personal practices as well. In fact, you could say I was a complete and total geek about it. I was searching for evidence of personal practice in every corner of a well-lived life. But as we know, life grants us no immunity from adversity, and Doug alluded to this a little earlier, and it came knocking for me, and it came knocking and knocking and knocking. And through a series of personal hardships, all of my personal practices and everything that I knew, it just went completely out the window. The personal practice girl had just fully lost her mojo. Mike Tyson famously said that everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. So it took some time. But eventually, I was able to get moving again. And when I did, I turned to my personal practices, and I took on a year of 30-day challenges. And so what that looked like was uh, something like, it, it couldn't be too complicated, it couldn't take too much time or special equipment or money. It just had to be something that I could complete every day within a 24-hour period. So the first month, I meditated every day for for 30 days. The following month, I did something that was kind of trendy that you might have heard about. I did the Marie Kondo challenge, and I, I looked at every article that I owned, whether it was in my office or my home or my car. If it didn't spark joy, out it went. The next month, I mixed things up. I tried doing things I'd never done before. I shot guns. I went up in a hot air balloon. I was brushing my teeth with my non-dominant hand. And things just started coming online for me a little bit. The following month, I did a, spent just a lovely month doing random acts of kindness. And as things started coming back online for me, I was able to just think and kind of tune in again to personal practice and what it really meant to me. And I thought about something that my old friend Jeff always used to say to me, and that is that movement begets movement. And so it was that I decided to take on the challenge of running uh, at least one mile every single day for a month. Now, I had been a runner off and on for most of my life, but never with any dedication or consistency. I would always I would get into it for a while, and then I would go and chase the next shiny object, like a classic dabbler, um, and then I'd get into it again. So I started off well enough, but about 10 days in, I thought, you know, this is going to be a little different, because life started happening, and the newness was wearing off, and I was doing things like going to a conference or a reunion, and I might fly all day and be in a conference room all day and have drinks with colleagues at night, and I'd get back to my room and say, ah, haven't run yet, got to go out for that run. Or it would be the next morning, and I would have a plane to catch, got to get that run in before I go. And as the days turned to weeks and turned into months, I was running when it was raining, it was snowing, it was hailing, it was hot, it was cold, it was windy, I was on a boat, I was in an airport. Whatever it took, I was doing it with dedication and with consistency. And as I was doing this, other things started coming online for me as well. And I started to be able to think about longer-term possibilities again. Um, and first, I saw this through running. And in my running, um, I got off of the road and onto the trails, and I started racing. 
I raced 25K, I raced 50K, I raced 100K. 100K, for any of you doing the math, that's 62 miles. Like me, that girl that had completely lost her mojo, I was racing up mountains and across rivers and doing all kinds of things that were previously unimaginable to me. And as I was checking the box, day after day after day, I started to be able to think about other possibilities for myself, and I was also checking the box towards some other beautifully completed projects. And I noticed that the people around me, things were happening for them as well. My friend Carrie, she was meditating every day. Michelle, she was running every day. I had other friends who were spending more time with their husband or their, or their wife, their spouses, their kids, or even practicing violin. But the thing is that if any of us had set out at the beginning with this long-term objective in mind, remember, here we are standing on this vista and there's the beautifully completed project. It's immediate gratification. It's still there in that canyon of distraction. But something happens when you're able to check that box every day. It scratches the immediate gratification itch, and it also allows you to move towards your longer-term objectives. 1,460, that's how many days there are in four years, and that's how many days in a row that I ran. These days, I'm still running, um, but I'm also walking. And I'm doing things with a little bit more um, time, a little bit more spaciousness. I'm looking for more of those well-felt present moments and stringing them together into my well-lived life because that's what I want. Now, the thing about immediate gratification, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere, and it is growing exponentially. So. I pose to you that a winning formula is actually not in denying or resisting immediate gratification, but actually in embracing it. But when we embrace it, infusing it with purpose, with intention, with dedication and consistency, and by doing that, we experience more flow and less struggle because, you see, you can have your marshmallow and eat it too.